So sometimes we want kq directly and we don't want kq times tau zero. So earlier we showed that the fluorescence quantum yield in the absence of a quencher is equal to the fluorescence rate constant times by that lifetime in the absence of a quencher. And we also show that the fluorescence yield with a quencher is equal to that rate constant for fluorescence times by that lifetime. And so we can also get at the Stern-Volmer equation another way. So we can take the ratio of those and we can show that's equal to what we have above. So that's Kf times pi tau zero over kf times pi tau, and of course those kfs exactly cancel out. And the stern volmer equation we had before, right, was 1 plus tau 0 times by that quenching rate constant times by that concentration of quencher. And so we've got an expression here now, so we'll go ahead and box this in blue. And uh, we can go ahead and we can rearrange this. We can divide both sides by, uh, let me see, tau sub zero, so the lifetime in the absence of a quencher. And that gives us one over tau, so the lifetime with the quencher is one over tau zero, the lifetime in the absence of it, plus, so the tau zero cancels out, so it's kq times by q. And again, we've got one of these brilliant y equals mx plus b equations. And so if y is our one over tau, and x is our quencher concentration, then presumably our rate constant then is just the slope of that graph. And so we can go ahead and make this kind of plot now to directly determine the quenching rate constant. So what would it look like? So uh, we have uh, one over that lifetime here versus the quenching concentration and we would expect to see a straight line and uh, now directly the straight line slope is equal to that quenching rate constant. So this is a much easier way to get directly at the, quen right, the quenching rate constant. So we can look at tryptophan. So tryptophan is one of those amino acids that uh, is pleasant in protein and it turns out when you dissolve it in water it fluoresces fairly decently but if your water contains dissolved oxygen then it quenches the fluorescence so it's much less intense than before. Most of the time when you do this kind of lifetime analysis, you have to remove all the dissolved gases, particularly that oxygen that can serve as a way to kind of sneak off those uh, those excited states and prevent them from fluorescing. And normally you do a, a freeze pump thaw cycle, so you actually freeze your sample. And just like in an organic lab, when you recrystallize, the uh, impurities kind of get pushed to the outside. So when you freeze your sample, all the dissolved oxygen, all the dissolved gases get pushed to the outside. Then you uh, expose it to a vacuum pump to remove those gases, and then you turn off the vacuum pump, or at least close the valve or something, and then you thaw. And then you proceed to freeze again, and then all those uh, those impure gases right get pushed out, and then you pump them off and you thaw. So as many times as you want to do it, uh, depending on how pure you need your sample to be. So we can go ahead and we can take some data here, actually, and uh, we can go ahead and calculate KQ. And so the data given in Atkins, um, he gives us the concentration of oxygen. And in order to remove units, he divides by 10 to the minus 2 moles per liter. And the, the fluorescence lifetimes have been determined uh, for, uh, I guess, five different solutions here in nanoseconds. So in the absence of a quencher, then, this would be 2.6 nanoseconds. So this, if you like, is our tau zero. And then as you gradually have more and more dissolved oxygen, so 23 millimolar would give you a lifetime that's shorter still, so one and a half. And as you increase the concentration of oxygen, notice that the deactivation of that excited state increases. And so the fluorescence lifetime gets correspondingly shorter and so shorter. And so if we go all the way out to, say, uh, 0.1 molar, um, then uh, the fluorescence lifetime is about five times faster than it was in the absence of oxygen. And so we can make this plot. So I went ahead and plotted this in Excel. And let me pull this file in. And here's a figure, I, I plotted it from Excel and sent it as a PDF. So initially this is the raw data right here. And then I went ahead and I converted to molarity and I converted to seconds. And then I went ahead and I just took the uh, concentration of the quencher, that's just the oxygen concentration. And uh, I uh, formed tau by uh, dividing by, or I plotted, sorry, one over tau, right, by dividing one into the uh, lifetime. And anyway, when I plotted this out, I got a really nice, beautiful straight line. And so there's my straight line, and my equation for the straight line is 1.28 times 10 to the 10. And of course, one of the problems with Excel, right, is that it doesn't actually keep track of the units. So uh, we know that the units themselves uh, are going to be uh, not dimensionless, right? So let's say kq is 1.28 
times 10 to the 10. And uh, let's see, we've got units of change in y over change in x. So we have units of uh, 1 over lifetimes here. So this is going to be 1 over seconds divided by uh, change in concentration. So that's molarity. So it's going to have units of molarity to the minus 1, seconds to the minus 1. Or if you prefer, you know, molarity is moles per decimeter cubed. So it would be decimeters cubed per mole if you invert it per seconds. And so just to give you kind of a feel, this is a pretty damn fast rate constant, right? So you got 10 to the 10. So this quenching reaction is happening very rapidly indeed. We can give a high level view of what's actually going on during quenching. And so uh, in quenching, right, we've got our excited singlet state and uh, the quenching molecule is reacting with it in a bimolecular fashion. And one possibility is it literally just bumps into it and carries away that energy. And so this is called collisional deactivation. Okay, another possibility is that the quencher uh, reacts with it and uh, we get electron transfer. And so either the electron comes from the quencher or uh, it comes uh, towards the quencher. So either one is a possibility. And uh, if it goes in the first direction, it'll form S minus anion and Q positive. And if it goes in the other direction, it forms S positive and Q negative. And so this is electron transfer. And actually, uh, I spent about five years of my life studying this kind of electron transfer reaction. So we went ahead and the quencher was actually inside of the same molecule. So we would excite one side of a large molecule and uh, it would form an excited state. It would fluoresce and decay away. And we'd actually build different uh, sort of quenchers or acceptor units inside the molecule. And so the one side would get excited and the electron could hop over to the other side and that would quench the fluorescence. And so we would look at the fluorescence lifetime and we could learn the rate of the electron transfer from that. So that was pretty darn awesome. Another possibility is uh, resonance energy transfer. And so the quencher uh, can essentially absorb energy through a resonance energy transfer process. And what that essentially means is that energy is transferred from the, from the S to the Q, so from the molecule of interest to the quencher. You'll sometimes hear this called FRET, so fluorescence resonance energy transfer. It's a very interesting uh, technique, actually. Uh, we can use it as a yardstick, so we can take a large biological molecule, and you can actually take uh, units like tryptophan, and uh, they tend to uh, uh, succumb to energy transfer, and the fluorescence lifetimes tells you how far away these units are from one another. The mechanism itself, uh, there's a little bit of information in Atkins, but this happens when the absorption spectrum uh, for S, so the absorption spectrum here for S, uh, overlaps with the fluorescence spectrum uh, for your quencher. And so the more it overlaps, uh, the more this energy is transferred from side to side. So we can use them as molecular yardsticks, but these are just three high-level ways that fluorescence itself is quenched by those quencher molecules. Now, the longer your excited state lives, the more these are important. So for your singlet states that uh, go up to S1 and pop back down to S0, this happens so quickly, the quencher molecule literally might not have uh, barely enough time to diffuse to it to react. But if you're doing uh, some uh, intersystem crossing, and uh, instead of looking at fluorescence, you're looking at phosphorescence. For phosphorescence, right, those groups can last. The, the, those uh, lifetimes are very long. They can last for milliseconds, let's say. So there's tons of time for these quencher molecules to bump into these phosphorescent excited states and quench that phosphorescence.